I wasn't really thinking about it being 30 years that you have allowed me to work for you, so it was a wonderful surprise, all your kind words and the beautiful pearls, and thank you very much. But thank you most of all for just letting me work for you. This is the greatest organization in the world, and every time I come to a meeting, I collect all kinds of pearls from our speakers, but also just from the opportunity to visit with you all who are here. After the splendid program that Dr. Held has organized, I'm not sure what else there is to say, but I will try to share a few thoughts with you about making American medicine great again. Now, if you talk about making America great again, you may expect to run into some hostility. And there are a couple questions that come up. Well, was America ever great to begin with? And the New York Times has the 1619 Project, which is, which is beginning, which states that America really began in 1619 when the first African slaves landed in Jamestown. And that ever since then, America has been an evil place based on slavery, discrimination, exploitation, and all kinds of other bad things. Well, as Mark Antony pointed out, the evil that men do lives after them, the good, is often turred with their bones. And I would suggest that although slavery was a great evil and a blight, blight on our history, America still has been great. And then the next question is, is should America be great? And there are a lot of people who think, who, that, who believe that it should not be, that we need to tear down America, and that it should be no better than anybody else. But America does have some ex exceptional features. The Declaration of Independence, the idea of unalienable rights, and the Republican form of government that was given to us in the US Constitution, which, by the way, is not a democracy. Our founders were very afraid of democracy and abhorred it, and free enterprise and the abolition of slavery. Ben Franklin said, we, we gave you a republic if you can keep it, and James Madison said, Democracies have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention, have ever been found incompatible with personal uh, security or the right of property, and have in general been as uh, short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. So there are more and more people who want to turn us into mob rule. If I were in charge of a curriculum, I would make this to be required reading. It really is a wonderful, fascinating book by Henry Grady Weaver called The Mainstream of Human Progress, which makes the point that all progress anywhere depends on the ability of individuals to make the best of their own gifts. And it's American freedom that made us great. How can you make the case that America stole from other people what never existed before? America had the greatest advances in liberty and prosperity that had ever been seen any time in the history of the world. But here's another foundation both of America and of Western civilization. This is a book by Dennis Prager called Exodus, God, Slavery, and Freedom. Most of you know Dennis Prager as a conservative talk show host. I did not know that he is also a Hebrew scholar and has taught courses on the Torah for 40 years to people of all religions or of no religions. And he believes that the Exodus really is the basis of Western civilization, as so many people did. The book, which I do recommend that you read, is fascinating. It really is a line-by-line -line commentary on the book of Exodus. And here are some of the the high points, namely that God is not a moon god, he is a, above nature, and that there are universal human worth and rights and that slavery is inherently wrong. Now probably three quarters of the people in the world were in bondage in ancient times, and that while the Exodus did not eliminate slavery, it made the foundation for saying that it's wrong. And by the way, it was about the only successful slave revolt in all of history. Spartacus got crucified, and the um, abolition of slavery in the West depended on abolitionists who firmly believed in the book of Exodus. As Moses' father-in-law, who was a Midianite priest, pointed out, the Ten Commandments of the Decalogue was handed down in the wilderness in the desert, in no man's land, and was meant to apply to all of humanity for all time. It was not just some dietary laws that applied to the chosen people, but to everybody. 
and some interesting things in there that said that everybody was to be treated equally under the law. The judges were not to give preference either to the rich or to the poor. No social justice there. It um, makes the most important point in it, I think, is that thou shalt not steal anything that belongs to another. And it makes private property something that was sanctioned by God himself. There was an outright ban on what was a universal uh, pro um, practice at that time of human slavery and makes a very important point that mass evil depends on lies. Well, we, there have been attempts recently to blot out the foundation of Western civilization. One of them was in the French Revolution, which was very different from the American War of Independence, which was meant to establish unalienable rights of, of human beings. The French was to destroy the old regime and talked about liberty, equality, and fraternity. Seductive even to Thomas Jefferson for a time until he found out about the or death part. This was the festival of reason that took place in the Cathedral Notre Dame where they threw out Our Lady and erected an altar to philosophy and they had women going about in Roman togas representing reason. But nobody thinks of that short-lived thing as symbolic of the French Revolution. Instead, you think of this which is something like this, is probably the end point of all revolutions that throw out the universal moral law. This was an early example of reparations. It's the execution of Marie Antoinette, the Austrian princess Maria Antonia, daughter of Maria Theresia, who was the empress of the late great Austro-Hungarian Empire. And her role, she just got married off to the king of France, which is what princesses were for back in those days, to form political alliances. She had nothing to do with centuries of oppression of the French peasantry. There wasn't anything she could do about it. Did she care? Well, this bit about let them eat cake was fake news, which we had even back in those days. Other people wanted to do away with the foundation from the book of Exodus. Friedrich Engels said, thou shalt not steal and thou shalt not covet are examples of the dominant class trying to impose respect for property on the exploited masses. Now, class warfare is what Marxism is all about. We therefore reject any attempt to impose on us any moral dogma whatsoever. We're kind of make it up as we go. And the Bible is a collection of fantastic legends without any scientific support. Of course, Friedrich Engels wasn't the only one. Dennis Prager quoted Hitler about the ancient curse we are fighting against the most ancient curse that humanity has brought on itself. Uh, the tyrannical God of the Jews and his life-denying Ten Commandments. And Hitler had this ambition that we were going to make mankind anew into a better form. The, if you don't like anything religious, this is the purely secular version of the Ten Commandments. I think this is by the financial analyst Richard Maybury that do not encroach on other persons or their property. Well, just go down the line. Don't take anything that belongs to another, not the honor that is due to him, not his life, not his spouse, not his property, not the fruits of his labor, not his good name. Uh, maybe we should add not his uh, liver or kidneys these days. Well, is American medicine great? I'm not going to repeat the best healthcare system in the world. I'm pretty tired of hearing that. The healthcare system is this $3.6 trillion industry, and as Dr. Waldman pointed out, 40%, and I would argue even more of it, is d dedicated to something that has nothing to do with either health or care, but only with money and control. And even if it were the best in the world, that doesn't mean that it's really great. And a great medicine means one that is founded on ethics. Now, is American medicine getting any better? How many people here think that? Well, the oath of Hippocrates is often talked about, and I don't think the a traditional oath is used in any American medical schools. The University of Arizona makes up its own. There are a lot of ersatz Hipp Hippocratic oaths out there that do a very massive editing job. Um, we're supposed to honor the secular authorities and the technocrats who are in charge of things. The bit about doctors being always healers and never killers has been obliterated completely. We're supposed to prescribe for the good of society or population health according to the best practices. 
and under the surveillance of the electronic health record. Of course, confidentiality is gone. I'm reminded of a talk and an article written by one of our past presidents, an orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Lee Heeb, who talked about Carl Brandt, also an orthopedic surgeon, excellent surgeon, saved many lives, became Hitler's personal physician kind of by happenstance. And he was practicing a kind of lifeboat ethics. Uh, this is his photograph at the a doctor's trial in Nuremberg uh, without his SS insignia. But the question was, well, who do we feed? Our, our wounded soldiers or these chronic schizophrenics? And if we're not gonna feed the schizophrenics, the doctor said, well, instead of watching them die a slow death from starvation, why don't we give them a death with dignity? Well, Carl Brandt, when he was, before he was um, hanged, said that well, allies had no right to judge him. He was just serving the fatherland. And indeed, he was serving a medical ethic that began 50 years, half a century, before Hitler came to power. And is interpreted by Leo Alexander in a 1949 New England Journal of Medicine article under Medic and Under Dictatorship. The lesson is we must never allow doctors to work for the state again. Can anybody identify this great humanitarian? Bismarck, Otto von Bismarck. He was Kaiser Wilhelm's Iron Chancellor. And he had the brilliant idea of the state taking over medicine and funding medicine. It was popular. It took care of the poor. He could say that it was Christian charity, although the Iron Chancellor's true motive was increasing the power of the Kaiser by making people dependent upon him for relief of pain and sickness. So if you're in favor of single-payer medicine or whatever else they want to call it, this is your founding father. So don't forget that. Well, at the Nuremberg trial, and this is a very interesting DVD, even if Alec Baldwin does star in it, <laughs> he was the uh, Supreme, Supreme Court Justice uh, who was in charge of the proceedings. And he was reflecting and searching for a means of you know, justifying the whole thing so that it would have a stature and a time, time enduring a status as setting a, a standard for the rest of the world. Because the German prisoners didn't have a point. We were following the law of the land, our land. You know, we talk a lot about the law of the land. Isn't that a great thing? And you won, we lost, so shoot us already. Why should you be putting us on trial and pre pretending moral superiority? Well, in the film it said, well, at the, the Palace of Justice in Nuremberg, he found a copy of the Ten Commandments, which sort of surprises me, because Hitler was pretty good at getting rid of those things. Well, other people who want to get rid of the Decalogue, I think, which is completely compatible with the US Constitution and with the Oath of Hippocrates, which has been traditionally our standard, is the new medicine and the old ethics by one of the founders of bioethics, Albert Johnson. Bioethics, you know, kind of expurgates a lot of stuff that's in the Oath of Hippocrates and is reflected in the AMA Code of Ethics, which is 500 pages long, but here are some of the high points that the physician is supposed to respect the law of the land. And maybe he should advocate for changes in it if he thinks it's bad for patients. But he's supposed to care for the health of the community, supporting access to care for all people. Doesn't stop at individual care, and he's supposed to balance his responsibilities to multiple stakeholders, not to his patients. The award-winning American Board of Internal Medicine won one of the probably the greatest number of the Golden Poop Awards of any of them, <laughs> reflects the same thing. You're supposed to be improving access to care and working on the just distribution of finite resources and managing conflicts of interest, of which, of course, they have quite a lot. Core principles of bioethics, so it's patient autonomy, whatever that means, because you can do away with it whenever it's overridden by what you think is a societal good, and maybe vaccine mandates. Um, provider beneficence and non-maleficence, I'm not sure why you need both of them, but I think both of them are related. If you have good intentions, that's what counts. And remember that Carl Brandt had good intentions. 
and it's about social justice, not equal justice under the law, but social justice. Lifeboat ethics is a, a major point of bioethics, and he, uh, Jeffrey Hall Dobkin, who wrote some excellent articles in our journal about the, these new ethics, he has both a perspective of a, a bioethics committee member and a patient who is suffering from a terminal disease. You know, we know that lifeboat situation occurs, but generally they're rare. We're not supposed to be out trying to create them like the Titanic did when it deliberately provided not enough lifeboats for the passengers. We create scarcity. And if you have a socialist economy with a redistribution of wealth, scarcity you know, under price controls and that sort of thing is guaranteed. It is inevitable and it only gets worse. They talk about fairness and they discuss the Good Samaritan. I mean, you've all heard that parable, and he, he, the Good Samaritan was supposed to be a good guy. But if that, that man was thinking only about the guy who was in the ditch, what about all the other millions of people throughout the world who needed medical care? Was it fair? Like from the perspective of the guy in the ditch, here you've got a man standing there who is willing and able to help you, has compassion, but he can't really do it because it would be unfair to some other people as determined maybe by the priest and the Levite. By the way, Albert Johnson was formerly a priest and they are making you know, these decisions for us. Bioethics is supposed to be antithesis of medicine. Medicine creates problems by saving lives and keeping sick people alive. Boy, the guy in the ditch, you know, he was already half dead, he had lived a privileged life before, who was he to, to merit uh, special consideration? Well, not only is the question of, is American, was American medicine ever great or is it great, but should it be great? I mean, there really is a war on excellence, which is part of the cultural Marxism paradigm. Um, the Excellence Deception, it said in an article in the Annals of Internal Medicine, a, you know, the flagship publication of the American College of Physicians, it justifies the emergence of new class hierarchies. Marxism is all about class warfare. Um, and the medical literature back at the time of the Chinese Cultural Revolution was really quite favorable toward the Chinese barefoot doctors minimally trained individuals who were doing the best that they could probably when the Chinese surgeons were being re-educated by hauling manure out in the countryside to get rid of this excellent pretense. And then there's the idea we can't have a two-tiered system because the private sector drains public resources and health workers' times, forgetting that all the resources came from private individuals in the first place. We need to have equality and the end of disparities over competence. Zeke Emanuel says we put too much emphasis on IQ. American Association of Medical Colleges has dramatically changed pre-med requirements. You don't need to know about organic chemistry. We just need to make sure that you have the right attitude. And then all, it's all about diversity and eliminating disparities and social justice. I mean, the New England Journal and JAMA are just full of this. I recommend to you the brilliant economist Thomas Sewell's most recent book, Discrimination and Disparities, that points out that disparities are not always because of evil people who discriminate, but just because of other things. But you know, looking at the, these articles in, in the New England Journal, you think, it reminds me of a line from a comedy that was on television a long, long time ago when I was a kid, back in the days when people still had a sense of humor, and a black comedian said to a pianist, now I want you to play in them black keys as often as you play on them white keys, which can be difficult if you're in the, the key of C major, for example. But it looks like the, the, these journals are just counting things, and they're forgetting things like the two cases that were presented at, at our CME meetings in Tucson Within one year, there was a case of scurvy and a case of wet beriberi. Both of them, the diagnosis was delayed, and in both cases, the patients could have died. 
Well, how about having something in the medical literature about the nutritional status of some of our patients? Should we be giving more of intravenous thiamine? I mean, what should we be doing to take care of all of our patients who have problems instead of counting things, counting beans, and trying to decide whether we have some racism hidden deep inside us? I think we're facing a choice of two paradigms now. Um, and the conclusions that we come to will follow from the assumptions that we make. There is the old medical ethics that assumes that there is a universal moral law and there is absolute objective truth. A and not A cannot both be true. You, you can get it wrong, but the truth is still out there. Or truth is whatever the party says it is or whatever you feel, whatever feels right to you with the inevitable corollary that might makes right. Well, a lot of people, you know, in the political debate, have their, their plan, and it all seems to be, we're, we're going to give you this and this and this, like, we'll see you for all your free stuff, and we'll raise you about $10 trillion. And if you object to that, they'll say, well, what's your plan for getting us to utopia? And the answer that I try to give is that the answer to one bad, destructive, central plan is not another central plan. That our proposal is the let my people go plan, no more pharaoh care. We want freedom for all, not pretend Medicare for all. And instead of buying into Medicare, and I don't know how you figure out what to charge for that, since after all, people in their Part B premiums are only paying 25% of the cost. I want a Medicare buy out. Or even if you're not willing to pay me something, just let me out. And there are ethical ways to pay for care. There are three of them. Cash, catastrophic insurance, and charity. Making somebody else pay or stealing or redistributing the wealth are not two eth ethical methods for paying. I'm going to figure that out. If we're trying to have any kind of plan, I try to remember my daddy's uh, rules for general contracting, that water doesn't flow uphill, and Friday is payday. A lot of people forget this very basic principle, which is why their roof leaks. Um, but Friday is payday. If you people work for you, you must pay them. They are not your slaves. The Torah forbids withholding a worker's pay even overnight. None of this, you file a claim and 90 days later, we may pay you or we may not, and we may take back what we pay you. Socialism, what, you can give it different, different things. It's universal health care. It's uh, a single payer, whatever you call it. And whether there is a pretense of private ownership or whether the government takes over everything, it all follows the fundamental axiom from each according to his means and to each according to his need. And somebody in authority will write those definitions for you. The main thing about socialism is based on lies. Remember, mass evil depends on lies. Um, it's got a terrible record. The failure rate in the United States is 100%. The mortality rate is awful, 100 million uh, worldwide. But somehow we think that technocracy will make it work, or our good intentions will make it work. This is another book you ought to look up. It was in 2002 by the late economist John Atarian about Social Security. Remember, Medicare is Title 18, Medicaid is Title 19. And these are the lies of Social Security. It's not an annuity, it's a tax. Its constitutionality is based on the same principle as the Affordable Care Act. There's no trust fund. It's uh, not an entitlement. And by the way, you lose all of it if you decline to take Medicare Part A. It's not solvent demographics guarantees that it will crash and burn. The Affordable Care Act is also based on lies and even if the President and Congress didn't figure it out, Jonathan Gruber and the Senator for, America, Senator for American Progress, Zeke Emanuel, knew exactly what they were doing. They were doing away with private payment mechanism and substituting a wealth redistribution plans. You could tell that it was a lie just by reading up through page 20 that it was going to outlaw uh, real insurance. And they may talk about evidence-based medicine, but since they determine what is evidence, it's just authority-based medicine. Uh, it does not improve health. Life expectancy has fallen for the third year in a row. These are the differences between insurance and socialized medicine. 
voluntary versus com compulsory, and maybe the most important thing is the last one. In a free enterprise economy, wealth is created. It is not a zero-sum game. What we give to one person does not have to be taken from somebody else. Results of the Affordable Care Act have been terrible. The percentage of health care workers doing administrative work is now one-half versus one-third. You've already seen this graph probably many times. Notice that it begins just after Medicare and Medicaid were enacted. It, this one ends in 2009, but if we carried it out to 2019, it would be looking even worse. And Medicaid expansion, is that charity for the poor? Well, no, as even the American Medical News knew back in 2010. Medicaid is the cash cow for the evil managed care cartel. They get their money first. Whether they give any medical care to anybody is uh, up for grabs. Well, it's up to us, and what can we do? We cannot enable them. We can opt out and not take their money, and really that is the only way to ensure that you can't be accused of defrauding them is if you didn't take their money. We can speak the truth. We can refuse to say things that are ridiculous no matter what the pressure is. And if we're stuck in the system and you really feel you can't do anything else, you can be the fifth column. Undermine it from within and support those who are not stuck in it. As the uh, British psychiatrist Theodore Dalrymple or Anthony Daniels pointed out, that an emasculated liar is really easy to control. Don't let them do that to you. The sine qua non of liberty is refusal to live by lies, and the price may be high. I like this poem by Matthew, Beth, by Matthew Arnold. It may be difficult. Creep into thy narrow bed. Creep, let no more be said. Vain thy Onset, all stand fast, thou thyself must break at last. Let the long contention cease. Geese are swans, and swans are geese. Let them have it how they will. Thou art tired, be thou still. They out talked thee, hissed thee, tore thee. Better men fared thus before thee. Fired their ringing shot and passed, hotly charged and sank at last. So charge once more then, and be dumb. Let the victors, when they come, when the forts of folly fall, find thy body by the wall. I am 100% convinced that as Henry Wadsworth Longfellow said, the wrong shall fail, the right prevail. I just don't know the timing, and maybe the only thing that is under our control is what side are we gonna be on? So guys, it's up to us. If we don't do it, who will? Thank you so much for coming. Go out and fight.